Hello everyone. So this video is going to be demonstrating how to use the LAN pattern template for random apps, which I developed. In the last video, I showed how to draw a circle, but of course, this uh, template is capable of much more than that, and that's what I'm going to be going through. So uh, when you open the template, the first sheet here is just an introduction um, explaining some different features and how to use them. But uh, if you're watching this video, this video should be demonstration enough to make you dangerous. So um, in terms of the work that's going to be done, everything is going to be done in the main sheet here. And the main sheet is comprised of two main sections. So the top section here is the player lands. So this is going to be defining where the player lands are going to be spawning. And then the bottom section here is defining just a basic pattern um, that's not going to be tied to player lands. And in the preview section here, we can see that the orange dots here are representing where the players are. And the blue dots here, well, they're actually dots, um, th that's representing the overall land. And uh, you can see right now it's um, a circle. So um, just by looking at this, we can see that there are quite a lot of parameters that can be modified. And to start demonstrating, I will be focusing on the main section here because it's going to be easier to see what everything does. So this entire template is predicated on the fact that um, the pattern is going to have some sort of circular identity. So at the most basic level, uh, the pattern is comprised of an angle increment and a base radius. So the angle increment is going to be determining how densely packed the individual lands of the pattern are going to be. And the base radius is going to define how far away to spawn the land with relation to the center of the map. So right now we have angle increment three, base radius 30. And so what that does is that it just takes angle zero degrees and calculates the x, y position for the first land increments the angle by the angle increment, which is three degrees, and then calculates a new x, y coordinate position for the next land, and then the next land, and the next land, until the pattern is complete. Um, and then in addition to that, there are some other parameters. So the x and y offsets, so pretty self-explanatory, you can um, change the x offset to translate the pattern in the x direction use the y offset to translate the pattern in the y direction, or reset those to zero. The offset angle can rotate the pattern. It's not going to look like much when the land is a perfect circle, but we can get to that in a minute. Um, so the next is base size, and that's going to be determining how thick the particular land pattern is going to be. So since the lands are drawn as a square, the base size determines how big that square is. And it's not necessarily the thickness of the land. So the thickness of the land is going to be um, two times the base size plus one. So that's something to consider when um, you're thinking about how thick this particular pattern is going to be. Consistent thickness, um, I will get to that in a minute. It's not very important right now. Um, next we have scaling. So the X and Y stretch, uh, basically we can give the value of the x stretch to be greater than one, which can stretch things in the um, x direction. We can give the value of the x stretch less than one to compress the land in the x direction. And the same applies to the y stretch. We can do something similar to that. So let's reset these. And then next we have the, sinuso the sinusoidal properties. So these properties are quite interesting in the sense that they can give a sort of fluctuating radius to this overall land pattern based on an amplitude and a frequency. So we can give an amplitude here, and that doesn't look too special on its own. But then we can give it a frequency, and we can see what that does here. So it can uh, fluctuate this radius based on the frequency and the amplitude that we specified. So the amplitude is five and it fluctuates by that amount. And if we increase the amplitude, you can see it fluctuates by qu quite a bit more. And the frequency is five. So it will do five fluctuations before the pattern is complete. We could also change it to six. And it would do six, we could change it to three. And it could do it like that. 
So that's pretty cool. And then the next thing we have is the spiral factor. So the spiral factor can, in, in essence, create a spiral. And the typical way to do that is to start out with a small radius, for example, 0, and give a spiral factor of uh, something greater than 1. Now, this will only create a spiral in one direction. Now, if you wanted to, say, for example, um, create a spiral in the other direction, you could potentially start out with a bigger radius and have a spiral factor less than one to do that. Or what we could also do is um, have a standard spiral uh, greater than one. We could start out with a standard spiral and set the y stretch value to minus one. So what that does is it effectively mirrors the pattern across the x-axis. Um, and that's just another thing to point out. See, all of these attributes can work in conjunction with each other. So I had a spiral factor and an x stretch attribute. And say if I wanted to give it a small frequency and amplitude, you can do that also. And now that this pattern is no longer symmetric, I can also give an offset angle to rotate this pattern after everything else has been applied. So you can see that this is a pretty powerful tool that can lead to a lot of possibilities. So we'll reset these and make them a bit simpler now. Uh, zero spiral factor, 30. Um, and now we can talk about the uh, boundary definitions for the pattern. So boundaries come in two different forms. We have the XY boundary that can define um, where the pattern is able to spawn in the um, XY axis. So the right now, the XY boundaries have pretty much no restrictions. They can go from 0 to 100% of the map's length in the X direction, 0 to 100% of the map's length in the Y direction. But if I limited that to, say, only spawn from 50 to 100 in the X direction, all I have to do is refresh the filter that's over here, and it'll get rid of all the land statements that are outside of this boundary. And if I did a similar thing with the uh, Y boundary, refresh the filter, and we can see it excluded those lands also. Uh, so reset these. And then the angle boundaries, um, in a similar fashion, can determine the angles in which the land can be included. So right now, there's effectively no restriction. It can go from 0 to 360 degrees. But say we could do from 90 to uh, 180, and then another one, 270 to 360. And with all the boundaries, refresh the um, filter. And we can see what this did here. It filtered out all of the lands that were outside of these defined boundaries. So that's how those work. We'll reset these. And then that just, um, um, this is all just in relation to drawing the pattern. So in order to translate this pattern into the game, we're going to need additional attributes. So for example, uh, terrain type. Um, so that's something that the game would need to use. And all of the other attributes that the land would need can be put in this box. So um, effectively, all you need to do is create one space and then type each attribute and leave a space between each attribute. So train type ice will append um, that attribute to each of the land statements down here. And now that we're focusing on the land statements, we can see how those are created here. And at the beginning of all of these is a comment that is showing each of the parameters that the land is comprised of. So this is um, uh, something I recommend that you copy over to the random map script once it's done, because um, there, when you're changing variables, and it, it's very easy to forget um, what parameters the land pattern had. And so this is just useful if you ever need to go back and figure out what, what they were.
So um, with that, I think we're ready to start uh, implementing this into the game. So you can just copy all of these land statements that the pattern is comprised of. We can go to a sample map. Of course, we need a land generation section in this map. And uh, considering this is just for demonstration purposes, that's all we're going to need right now. And so if we go into the game, um, we can test that and we can see what it generated. And so basically all it did was it generated a square land at each of the coordinates that was specified and specified by our pattern here. And there are a couple things I would like to point out about this. So um, first of all, the thickness of this land isn't always consistent. Since, for example, the land that's spawning here, you can see that square there, and you can see that square there. So they're relatively far apart, so that they're only touching at the edges here, which makes this uh, part of the land uh, quite a bit thinner than this portion, for example. And this is uh, more prominent on larger maps that we can see here, where each um, percent of the map's length is going to account for more tiles relative to the base size. And there can be certain situations in which you would want a more consistent thickness, and we can get to that in a minute. And then also notice that this uh, template is only capable of producing the outline. And there can be certain situations in which you would rather create a solid land based on this pattern rather than a hollow ring. And there's a way to do that, which I will demonstrate. So. Basically, all we need is one more create land statement. And what we need here is a terrain type. And it can be the same terrain as the outline or a different terrain, uh, depending on how you want the cliffs and elevation to uh, be able to behave. So for now, we'll just use the same terrain. It's going to be ice. And then for the other attribute that we need here is land position. And that's going to be right in the middle, 50-50. So let's think about this for a second. So it's going to target the middle of the map for the land. And when we do this, you can notice that it's going to take up all of the land that the, that the land pattern encompassed. And in a similar fashion, instead of going right in the middle, 50-50, we can change this coordinate to 1-1. One, one. And instead of filling all of the inside of the land pattern, we can notice that this particular land is now filling all of the outside of the land pattern. So that's how that's done, but for the purposes of the next demonstration, I want it actually in the middle. And now um, we're going to go to the issue of addressing the consistency of the thickness. So now that we have this intermediate step where we're able to create a solid land based on that land pattern, what we can then do is go to a terrain generation section and create a terrain, which has to be different from the base terrain of course, the base terrain is going to be ice, and percent is going to be 100, and the spacing to other terrain types is going to be 3, for example. And if we can see what this did here, it now maintains a much more consistent spacing that is still maintaining the shape of the land pattern that we had specified earlier. And all right, so up till now, I've given off a lot of information. So I think we can then switch our focus to a bit more of a practical example. And that example here is going to be Weaving River. So the concept of this map is relatively simple. The players on the map are more or less spawned in a circle with a river weaving in between them. So it alternates one player on the inside of the river, one player on the outside, the next player on the inside, 
and so forth. And then the pattern that this map was based off is relatively simple. So the base uh, radius of the player lands and the base radius of the overall land is the same. And the uh, pattern is based off of a sinusoid with amplitude 10 and the frequency of uh, however many players there are in the game divided by 2. So in a 4v4, that frequency is 4. And we can see um, how the uh, players are spawning. So in some situations, the player lands, how you spawn them, are going to be more or less independent of the um, overall land pattern that you would use. But in this case, since it's very necessary to be able to spawn directly in the peaks and valleys of the river, we would need to use a direct placement based on uh, these parameters here. And we can see that the, the parameters of the player lands are, are relatively very similar to the parameters of the mainland. But you're not necessarily going to have to use all of them um, um, the same way. So for example, all we need to spawn the player lands here is the angle increment, which is eight, uh, 360 divided by 8, which is 45 degrees, and the radius, which is 33. Um, and then, yeah, we got to notice here that this particular land pattern would only apply to a 4v4 situation. If we would have to have a 3v3 situation, we would have to have a, a different land pattern. And it would look like that. And we can, if we take a look at the code here, we can see that th that's exactly what's happening here. So since this is a direct placement map, it has to first take a look at how many players in the game to define what uh, pattern layout to choose. So if it's a, at least seven players in the game, it will have to create a land pattern that would resemble this. If we scroll down further, if there are at least five players in the game, so a 3v3 example, we would have to create a different pattern based on a different frequency. And if we open up a 3v3, we can see how that different land pattern was generated uh, based on the number of players that were present. And of course, um, when you think about the concept of the map, this only really is applicable when there are an even number of players on the map. And that's one of the limitations of many direct placement maps. Um, they're kind of dependent on the player number. So um, in this particular case, if there were um, an odd number of players, say five players in the game. Of course, it doesn't spawn the same way. It spawns as a nomad map because there aren't really enough uh, spots within this land pattern to place the players. I mean, uh, we couldn't just give the frequency a 2.5. That wouldn't work very well at all. So um, that's just something to consider um, when you're working with special type maps like these. Um, you can gain quite a bit of benefit by having some interesting dynamics for gameplay at the limitation of losing a bit of flexibility in regards to settings and player number and that sort of thing. So before I go on to the next example, there's just one more th there's just a couple more things I wanted to emphasize here. So when we're dealing with this template, the main thing to keep in mind is that the rotational symmetry is always going to be the priority that's going to be preserved. And what that means in a nutshell is that the offset angle is always the last thing that's going to be applied. And we can see that if we have a land with an X offset here, we apply the angle offset 45 degrees. And we can notice that it applied the X offset first before rotating that 45 degrees, which means it's rotating based on the origin of the map rather than the origin of the land pattern, which would be approximately there. Okay.
So the next example I wanted to go over was the map Weaving Woods, which is based on the same land pattern as the map Weaving River, which we just looked at. But the fact that we're now dealing with separation based on a tree line rather than a shallow river is going to allow us to emphasize some interesting points. And the first is that this is a uh, prime example of where a consistent thickness for the uh, uh, land pattern is going to be beneficial. Since players are going to be, have, be having to chop out of this, it's good to have um, a consistent thickness to chop out wherever, you're, wherever you decide to place that lumber camp. And the other interesting thing about this map is that uh, we have to be very aware of how the land pattern is going to affect the placement of objects because since we have this tree line here we want to be sure that the resources for this particular player are going to be spawning on the inside of the land pattern whereas the resources for this particular player are going to be spawning on this side of the wood line and so we need to go back and think about what we know about objects so if we take a look at an object command so the secondary sheep for example. So when dealing with objects that are referenced to the players, that have the attributes set place for every player, min distance to players also means min distance to the origin of a neutral land. And in case you weren't aware before, there are many, many neutral lands um, in this map. And so what that means is that the the secondary sheep are going to have to spawn 14, at least 14 tiles away from the player, but they're also going to have to spawn at least 14 tiles away from the origin of the land pattern. Now let's think about what that means. So uh, 14 tiles away from the land pattern means either 14 tiles in this direction or 14 tiles in this direction. Now if we think about it, if it spawned 14 tiles away from this direction, that would put it too far away from the player for this maximum distance to be satisfied. And therefore, the only place that the secondary sheep could have been placed is on the inside of the land where it could still satisfy the max distance based on that other attribute. And we can see this if we emphasize this quantity a bit more. We can increase the groups from 2 to 200. We can see that, and in addition to the spacing it um, must maintain away from the, um, the player stone and whatnot, it also has to stay away from the, um, the wood line because it was generated based on many neutral lands. And since the objects reference to players have to avoid neutral lands, it has to avoid the wood line. Um, so that's basically how that works, and it's one situation in which um, this rule about objects can uh, potentially be, be beneficial. And the last example I wanted to take a look at was this one. So the land pattern that this map is based off of is quite simple. It is basically a circle. So we have uh, the neutral lands comprising a circle, and unlike the other two examples, we have the player lands spawning directly inside this land pattern rather than around it. That makes sense. Um, and we'll take a look at some things to notice here. So the first thing I want to mention is that the land pattern is drawn with squares and the orientation of the square does not change with the angle. So that means it always um, draws the square normal and draws the square normal here. Now one thing to keep in mind is that the diagonal of the square is about 40% longer than the side of the square. And what that means is when we get to angles 45 degrees, the thickness of this land is going to be about 40% uh, thicker than it is going to be at angles 0 degrees. So at the top, bottom, left and right, it would be the most thin and at these uh, in between angles it would be thickest and depending on uh, what you're trying to achieve 
there can be implications for that. So um, this land pattern has an option to enable consistent thickness. So what this does is when I enable consistent thickness, it can adjust the base size of the land of the individual lands based on what angle they would end up being. So if we take a look, um, when we're starting at angle zero degrees, the base size is going to be at, the, at its maximum of 15. And as we get uh, further and further down, we'll say at 45 degrees, this would be the base size minimum at base size 11. So if we take this new code and copy it over what's existing here, we can see what it does. So you can see that um, compared to the last generation, um, these um, sort of uh, these the thickness of the land at 45 degrees is a bit more consistent um, relative to the thickness of the land at zero degrees. So <clears throat> that's the way the pattern hands it, handles it, and that works reasonably well. But you also have to keep in mind that we are limited to only integer inputs for the base size. So um, it could potentially be overcompensating or undercompensating um, that base size based on how it rounds. Um, but if you are ever concerned about a certain player not having enough space, we can talk about what um, options we have. So for now, let's um, disable consistent thickness and reduce the uh, thickness of this land generically. So we'll you place this in our code to be a bit thinner. And now let's say we were concerned about the players um, at zero degrees not having enough space. So let's just try something um, at first. So right now we have specified that the number of tiles in this particular land is going to be zero. And that means it's going to um, default to as small a size as it can be, which is going to be um, based on the base size. Now notice that the player lands don't have a base size specified, so it's going to be using whatever base size was specified by the neutral land pattern in this section of the code here. But let's say we wanted to increase the number of tiles at um, angle zero to a thousand, which should be bigger than base size 11. Let's try and check that real quick. Calculator. So base size is, well, the thickness of the square is 2 times base size, which is 11, plus 1. And if we square that, um, 529 is the amount of tiles that the square should be. So if we specify 1,000 tiles, we should see something noticeably bigger. But if we generate this land, we can see that no difference, um, there was no difference at all. And that has to do with the fact that when um, you have two lands occupying the same position, the game is going to prioritize whichever land has the bigger base size. So what we can try to do next is instead of having no base size specified, we can specify base size of this particular land to be 13 which is going to be bigger than whichever base size it overlapped with the neutral land because those all have base size 11. So if we try that, we can see that this guy was now able to spawn its full thousand tiles. So um, that's how that works. But um, I'm going to revert that change real quick because I'm trying to point out some other things here. So get rid of this. All right, so the other thing I wanted to point out in this map is that we can see that there are quite a bit of a shortage of resources here. Like we can look at the objects generation code and we're supposed to have a primary gold here between um, 12 and 16 tiles away from the player base. And I'm looking around here and I don't see any of that spawning. 
And that has to do with the other rule about objects, is that when objects are referenced to the players, the min distance to players also means min distance to the origin of a neutral land. And since this entire circle here is comprised of neutral lands, that particular gold pile has to avoid all of them. And since those lands are so densely packed, there's no way that that gold pile can satisfy that attribute to stay 12 tiles away from all of those lands and still be placed. So we're going to have to find a way to get around this. And whether this particular thing is just a bug or feature, we still need to deal with it in this case. So instead of using min and max distance to players, uh, we're going to try to do something else. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to put flag A at the origin of the player land and copy that. And what I'm going to do here is going to give it an actor area of ID 12 actor area radius of 12. And then similarly, actor area on this particular flag is going to be actor area 16 with the actor area radius of 16. So, and then instead of minimax distance to players, what I'm going to do here is avoid actor area 12 and then an actor area to place in 16. So if we take a look at this, we can see it was able to successfully generate these gold piles per player based on those actor areas. So that's one way to get around that particular issue. So we use actor areas reference to the uh, player lands instead of um, using min and max distance. So that sort of thing could be done with the other objects in this um, script that are going to have trouble spawning, for example, the stone. Um, but um, in order to make this a bit more nice looking, I'm going to um, change this flag A to an invisible object. So const can be anything, and that's going to be object 278, which is actually a dead fish trap. And that's invisible and um, will allow us to be a bit more seamless with everything here. So this gold is able to spawn and we don't have that flag as a visual. And I think that about wraps up everything I wanted to cover in this video. So if you have any questions or comments or suggestions on what I could do to um, improve this, um, just let me know, leave a comment or something. Um, I'm always interested in um, improving this to see what other capabilities you can have. But uh, I believe that's it for now. So as always, I hope you've learned something and I'll see you next time.